So we were in the kind of begun the proof of this important theorem uh, for finding optimal DR plans. Um, and it basically says that um, if you know that the graph, um, you know, uh, is independent in the rigidity matroid. So essentially we can assume that there is an abstract underlying abstract rigidity matroid and independence is defined in that matroid. And so we're just looking at this graph and uh, rigidity and so forth are all defined in this matroid. And um, you know, when we talk about rigid and so forth, we mean rigid vertex maximal proper subgraphs, we mean that. And so in that case, if it's independent, then we have certain just count conditions that we can rely on. So, um, and, and um, we can even assume that um, there is in, an oracle that will um, sort of tell us whether something is uh, rigid. And uh, we, or we can use this, if there is a sparsity matroid that is associated with it, there are, you know, network flow, pebble game type algorithms that will decide whether something is rigid. So the, uh, the optimality here uh, is equated to this, optimality of the DR plan is equated to the DR plan being canonical. So that if we can then, as an algorithm, if you're able to find this canonical DR plan, then we are more or less done, right? Um, so, <clears throat> and then we, when the algorithm, uh, when we talk about the algorithm, which we already did briefly, but we can go a little more this week. Um, <clears throat> the algorithm is, um, uses actually a variant of this canonical DR plan called the pseudo sequential DR plan. And we'll come to that later. So anyway, right now, what we're trying to show is that this canonical DR plan is the optimal DR plan. Okay. So uh, we, these, this observation and this lemma we went through uh, last week. Um, so essentially it's just saying that um, certain simple conditions can be assumed because we happen to know that the overall graph is independent. Okay, so, and then, um, we're going to rely on these two. I proved uh, the first one, um, so we'll skip that proof. Um, and now we are sort of in the proof of the theorem itself. So <clears throat> we simply construct the canonical DR plan. And later on, I mean, and, and in fact, we did this proof also. This is simply saying that, you know, there, there is a canonical DR plan because the definition of the canonical DR plan has two conditions and it's not clear that there is always a DR plan that satisfies those two conditions. Um, we, we just said, let's start with a complete DR plan, which is known to exist. Complete means children at every stage are all the rumps, rigid vertex maximal proper subgraphs. This is of course a huge thing and has no chance of being optimal um, because at any node, you know, you have lots and lots of rigid vertex maximal proper subgraphs. So um, the goal is to sort of trim it down. And then of course that uh, leads to the first property that if, uh, sorry, second property that if their intersection is large enough, if a pairwise intersection of any two of these rumps is large enough, then it's sufficient to retain just exactly two of them. And because their union is the whole thing. And that was one of the lemmas, uh, that was the lemma before. And, um, and if otherwise, you know, you retain all of the children. Uh, so this, if we can show, is has satisfies all the properties of the canonical DR plan, and so we're done. And uh, so essentially, this uses the lemma to to prove this uh, the fact that this this can be constructed. Okay. Um, now the, the now we need to show that the DR plan is optimal. I don't know if I can make it a little bit bigger uh, without. Um, yeah, I guess we could go from here. Right, so, um, so, uh, so essentially the property two, um, you know, the property two is this rigid vertex maximal subgraphs. So we also observed this last time is that we can um, always modify the property uh, uh, modify the DR plan to satisfy that property without increasing the maximum plan n. So essentially our, opt uh, our 
our measure that we're trying to optimize is the fan in. And so increasing the depth of the DR plan, we, can, we don't care about. So we can always increase the depth of the DR plan by just adding some nodes along the path to the root. Um, and as long as it, um, uh, it, it ensures this uh, rigid vertex maximal property, we can always uh, achieve this. Okay, so the proof, um, okay, so the proof of the optimality is done by induction on the height of the DR plan. So the base case is uh, essentially height zero, which is, which means that all the nodes are single edges. Uh, the induction hypothesis is that the canonical DR plans of height T are optimal for the for whatever graph happens to be at the root node. Okay, so the root node has a graph. I mean, without because the original graph that we started out with is independent, whatever this graph is is also independent. So all the properties that we proved with lemma and, and the, on the observation are all still true. So it's just saying that the DR plans of height T uh, are optimal for the root node. So um, for whatever the graph happens to be at the root node. And then for the induction step, we take a canonical DR plan of T plus one rooted at a node. And um, we can assume that the the DR plans that are the subtrees, so to speak, of the children are themselves canonical for them because that's how they have been constructed. And so from the induction hypothesis, we, know, uh, we, we, we happen to know that R of CI, which means the canonical, the DR plan for the children, each one of the three, uh, children of the node C uh, is in fact optimal for its CI. So because uh, we are just saying that the canonical DR plan is optimal. So we know that the DR plan sitting under each one of the children is itself optimal for uh, that node, I mean, that graph, which is sitting at CI. So what we're going to do is demonstrate that there is a set of nodes that must be present in any DR plan R for C. Uh, so just to, uh, you know, I keep talking about the two properties and we saw the two properties a moment ago, but let me just uh, um, remind you of the two properties. Where are the two properties? Here. So, um, um, yeah, children are the rigid vertex maximal subgraphs of the parent. And then if, uh, so essentially if you, either they all intersect trivially or they have exactly two that uh, intersect non-trivial. And I think when here, when we're referring to property two, it's the, um, yeah, so property two is basically just the, um, um, let me think here. I think here property two is uh, the property one. <laughs> uh, that's because this is done in uh, two different, taken from two different sources. Um, Yes, so this is that it's the children are rigid vertex maximal proper subgraphs. That's that's what this property two is. Okay. So um, so it's sufficient to demonstrate a set of nodes that must be present in any DR plan that satisfies property two, which means that the children are rigid vertex maximal proper subgraphs. Property one is that you only pick two of them if their intersection is non-trivial, or pick all of them their intersection pairwise intersection is trivial. And we know that these are the two clear cases. You can't have the situation where some pairs of, some pair is non-trivial and some pair is trivial because of the rigid, uh, rigid vertex, max, vertex maximal property. And we proved that in one of the lemmas, I mean, in the lemma or the observation. So, um, so yeah, so it's just, uh, so, so we are going to show that any, a DR plan that satisfies property two must have a particular set of nodes S. And furthermore, for any such uh, DR plan, either the, there are two claims, S must be the set of children of C, or for all the ancestors of S, R has the minimum possible 
possible fan in of two. So in a, either, either S is already the set of children of C, or if you actually have something in between C and S, so in other words, some in, in intermediate ancestors of S, then you can simply say that um, the, the, the root, you don't have to worry about it because the root uh, has the minimum possible fan in of two. So we're trying to show that it's optimal. And we know that we can never get lower than two. So um, if we can show that it has the minimum possible fan of two, then we're done. So these are the two possible cases, right? So S has to be present. We know that any DR plan for C that satisfies property two must have that property. Uh, and so either, and then we show one of these two things. So basically uh, that's the strategy of the proof. So the, so the first claim is that for a node C whose uh, clusters have trivial pairwise intersections, any um, DR plan of C that satisfies property two must also satisfy property three at C, i.e. the set of children S of C consists of all clusters of C. Okay. Um, because this is the only choice, it's the minimum Fanon at C for any DR plan C with property two, including a known optimal one. So property two, remember, is that its children are the rigid vertex maximal sub proper subgraphs. So, and property three is that uh, essentially they are uh, have trivial intersections. So either, it, uh, sorry, if they have trivial intersections, then all of them are there. So, um, so, so what we're trying to show is that um, if C's children are all of these nodes that have to be present, then it must be the case that they actually have trivial intersections. And in that case, we don't really have a choice. We have to have them as the children. Okay. The second claim shows that the, the case of uh, node C whose rigid vertex maximal proper subgraphs have non-trivial pairwise intersections, every canonical DR plan of C that uses any possible choice of two such subgraphs results in the maximal possible fan in two sorry, minimum possible fan in two in the ancestor nodes A, leading to the same maximal uh, anti-chain of descendants of C. So what essentially what this is saying is that in the other case, uh, every, so, so if S, if the elements of S are not directly the children of C, then sort of the path, so to speak, from this uh, S uh, to the descendants of C, are all nodes with fan in exactly two, okay? So uh, there are only two choices. So overall, we're trying to show that S is a set of clusters that must be present in um, any, uh, uh, any, any uh, DR plan that satisfies the property. And um, that because, uh, S must be present, the two options for S, um, neither one of them, either it's unavoidable, it will be present in every DR plan. So the every DR plan is going to have that size or uh, we ensure that all the intermediate nodes have fan in exactly of two. So uh, that doesn't really change the optimality, okay. So uh, the antigen is maximal in the partial order of rigid subgraphs of C under containment, i.e. S satisfies the property that every proper vertex maximal rigid subgraph of C is a superset of some D in S. Okay, so, um, So because it's a maximal antichain, no element of S is contained in the union of other elements of S and the union of elements of S is in fact C, right? So um, property of DR plans has to, I mean, you cannot have a, a basic DR plan, canonical or not, has the property that their union, the children, union of the children is the parent. And uh, so because of that, um, um, you know, that, that we're going to use that to say that these children S have to be present, these, sorry, nodes S have to be present in any DR plan that has that property. So, um, 
So, so we're using that here. So thus any DR plan that satisfies property two and hence contains two or more of the rigid vertex maximal proper subgraphs of C, the children must also contain every element of S. So together, the two claims complete the proof that every canonical DR plan is optimal. So essentially what this page is saying is that uh, once we prove the two claims, then um, the, it would then uh, imply that the canonical DR plan is optimal. I don't know, I'll stop here for a, it's kind of a, as I mentioned last time, it's an interesting way of proving that a structural property, namely this canonical DR plan, ensures that um, th that, that structural property ensures optimality among all DR plans, uh, which don't necessarily have to be canonical. So uh, the only property of DR plans that we care about here are that their union of the children is the parent and they're all rigid. Okay. Um, Okay, so now we can go ahead and start proving the two claims. So the first claim that is, says that the set of clusters whose pairwise intersection is trivial, uh, in, sorry, um, whose pairwise intersection is trivial be, must be children of C in an optimal DR plan. So what we're saying is that um, uh, in an optimal DR plan, if, if the children of, I mean, sorry, if the C has a bunch of um, rigid vertex maximal proper subgraphs whose pairwise intersection is trivial, then they must be uh, children. So to show that um, the union of no subset of the children can be C, thereby requiring all of them to be included as children. Okay, so this is, um, so remember that the, the, for any DR plan, the union of the children has to be the parent, has to cover the parent, yeah, has to be the parent. So um, if, we, uh, if we can show that for any pair of these, if their intersection is trivial, then, or any, any, any proper subset of them, uh, their union cannot be C, then it must be that they must all be included. Okay. So we prove this by contradiction. So, so once we prove this, then we are basically saying that um, in, a in the canonical DR plan, the case where the parent has uh, rigid vertex maximal subgraphs where all have pairwise trivial intersections, uh, there's nothing much you can do uh, in terms of decreasing the fan in over there because they all have to be children in any DR plan, canonical or not. Okay, so, <clears throat> so to prove this by contradiction, you assume that a strict subset is uh, minimally rigid. Um, uh, I mean, by definition, I mean, by definition of DR plan and because the whole thing is independent, you know, the, the nodes are being rigid implies they're actually minimally rigid. So if this U is not C, then we found a larger proper subgraph contradicting vertex maximality of CR, okay? So it must be that U is equal to C. By the way, we already said that we can without loss assume vertex maximality, if you remember, because we can always introduce intermediate nodes um, in the DR plan uh, that ensure vertex maximality uh, without increasing the fan in. <coughs> so here we are assuming everything is vertex maximal. So without loss, we can assume that the only DR plans we're considering are the ones that uh, have this rigid vertex maximality property. So, um, so if U is not equal to C, then we found a larger proper subgraph contradicting vertex maximality. So it must be that U equals C. So in fact, I have to point out that in the first, if you read the original papers with the DR plan, we didn't use this vertex maximality property. What we used was something that we called cluster minimality, which is exactly what this is. It's saying that, um, you know, if, if um, this, this extra property that we have here, so that um, if you took, a, if you took a, any node of the DR plan, no proper subset of its children would have been rigid. 
So in other words, in, in any node of the DR plan, if you look at the set of children, it's sort of like a minimal subset whose union is rigid. So uh, if you took any proper subset of them, it would not have been rigid. So that's more, uh, so that was a different, slightly different condition than this vertex maximality, sorry, rigid vertex maximal proper subgraphs, but um, it's here we are using that, that property here. So we're saying that this means that we would have found a larger proper subgraph contradicting vertex maximality. So it must be that U equals C. <clears throat> However, since the intersection is trivial, um, so we know that U intersects. So we, the, one of the items of the lemma that we used in the beginning uh, <clears throat> is that if the intersection is trivial, then um, their union, if sorry, if their union is isostatic, then for every k c i union, c k is isostatic. And if the intersection is trivial, then for every k in the intersection between any two of them is trivial. So if you go here, uh, sorry, claim one, claim one. Okay, so this would mean that, uh, um, so you intersect uh, c k must, be one or more trivial, i.e. disconnected vertices. Okay, so by definition of DR plan, CK, which is C intersect CK, um, and, you know, so because it's contained in the, ch child isn't contained in the parent, so we'll know that U equals C, so CK is actually U intersect CK. So uh, CK is a collection of disconnected vertices and an isostatic subgraph of C, which is not possible. Right. So since C is isostatic, it means that the union of no proper subset of C1 through Cn is isostatic, nor is it equal to C, thereby proving claim one. Okay. So claim one essentially saying that uh, in uh, once you have a set of clusters whose pairwise intersection is trivial, they must all be, uh, they're all contained in C, then they must all be children of C in any optimal DR plan with no canonical conditions ex on, except for the fact that their union must include the parent, um, m m must uh, cover the parent. Um, furthermore, since canonical DR plans has nodes with proper rigid vertex maximal subgraphs as children, um, uh, if as in this case, their pairwise intersection is trivial, it follows that any node has at most as many children as a DR plan without this restriction because the union of the children must contain all edges of the parent, right? So that's the union covering thing. So therefore a canonical DR plan is the optimal choice in the case of trivial intersections. Okay, so now we have to consider the case of non-trivial intersections, okay? And that's essentially what two is talking about. So if some pair of the uh, child clusters has a non-trivial intersection, then choosing any two as children will result in the same maximal anti-chain of descendants of C. So uh, this is basically saying that throughout to get to C1 through, uh, sorry, to get to um, uh, the, uh, you know, all the intermediate nodes that we would have would all have a fan in of two so that you're not really doing any worse than uh, the optimal DR plan. Okay, so to prove claim to note that if CI intersects CJ is isostatic, then by one of the, the first observation that we showed, CI union CJ is also isostatic. This is all, all based on the fact that the overall graph is independent. This means that by isostatic, remember, is minimally rigid. This means that um, the union of any two children, again, by the lemma, the union of any two children of C is C itself. Thus, any two children can be chosen to make a canonical DR plan that is the minimum possible fan in node for that DR plan. However, to guarantee that any two are the optimal choice, it must ensure that the minimum fan in over all descendants leading up to a common maximal anti-chain S of subgraphs. Okay, so this S that has to be present in every DR plan, in every optimal DR plan. Okay, so you're making a choice here, right? So the problem is in the previous case, there was no choice. So essentially we said, 
if the children, sorry, if a nodes um, max uh, children are, are, are have non-trivial intersections, then every DR plan is forced to have uh, all of those nodes as children because no subset of them is rigid. So it really, and since the pair, uh, they, they together have to cover the parent in any DR plan, they all have to be children. So that particular fan in was unavoidable. In this case, we're saying if their intersection is non-trivial, then you make a choice, but then the, the fact that you're making a choice here doesn't hurt anything. So first of all, you can make a choice. Any pair of them is going to cover the parent. That's fine. Secondly, we're also going to say that which pair of them you choose, uh, it really doesn't matter because in any DR plan, there's got to be a particular subset as of graphs and the path, so to speak, the intermediate nodes between S and C in this uh, canonical DR plan will all have fan in two nodes, so it's not going to make any difference. So to prove that this holds, I mean, it's not gonna change the optimality property. So to prove this, let's take uh, the set, um, so denote the intersection of all the elements in this set of the cluster CK to be I. And let's take RK to be C difference this CK. So if you took CI and CJ where I not equal to J are the children, uh, let's say that those are the children. So we can assume that all subgraphs are induced subgraphs of C. That's how we pick them. Rigid vertex maximal proper subgraphs are all induced. We know that C equals I union this remainder, so to speak, all of these remainders by, by the way we've defined them. And CI is the intersection union these remainders. So think of this as this is the in common intersection of all of them. And this is all the remainder stuff, which is not an in intersection. And <clears throat> C is this union of the remainders of all and CI is the union of uh, all except one, the i one. So the isostatic vertex maximal subgraphs of CI are in fact, I union this, uh, you're, you're taking out the i one and the first one, i one and the i minus, i one and the second one and so forth, i and I'm, and so forth, you continue like this. All of whose pairwise intersections are isostatic subgraphs. So any two of these are viable children for CI. This continues for n minus one levels, always with fan n of two, at which point every descendant of C is some I union RK for this, with every K appearing at least once. So at the last level, there are exactly two rigid vertex maximal proper subgraphs and hence a unique choice of a pair. So essentially this is just showing that um, how you chose the choices, I mean the pair at every stage, regardless of the sequence of choices of CI and CJ and of their descendants at each level, the DR plan has the optimal fan in of two for every node for n levels and the collection of last level nodes contain the same maximal anti-chain of subgraphs for all choices, okay? So essentially, um, this is just saying that, you know, in the, there are two cases, the trivial intersection case is unavoidable and the other case you make a choice and the choice ensures optimality because the fan in is always two and, um, you know, um, the last level nodes at this bottom have to be present in every DR plan. So you can't really avoid that either. So that's, um, so that's the overall structure of the proof to show that the canonical DR plan is in fact optimal. Um, so now the algorithm, I'm just quickly going to go over the algorithm that we talked about before. It uses this idea of a branch, which I think is another, a new idea in this paper um, to to um, uh, to to find the optimal. So we, we change the canonical DR plan slightly into something called a pseudo sequential DR plan that makes the 
um, algorithm much faster. I mean, much easier to analyze and so forth. So, um, so we have this um, canonical DR plans, you know, as we, you know, this is a pairwise intersection, rigid vertex maximal per, per subgraph, so with the pairwise intersection being non-trivial in this case. And then, uh, you know, you can think of it this way. So because the intersection is non-trivial, there's a common intersection and these are the remainders. And, <clears throat> and you continue in this fashion, right? Um, so we want to prove um, that this, uh, so we define this new class of DR plans called pseudo sequential DR plans. And we show that the Fanon is no larger than the canonical DR plan. And then we show how to build it. So there's a second sort of layer of the proof. The first layer was just to show that this canonical DR plan is optimal. And the second is more based on uh, the, the second proof is an sort of needed by the particular algorithm that we have is that we use this other particular class of canonical DR plans called pseudo sequential DR plans. And we essentially show that they are like canonical in the sense that they, their fanon is no larger than the canonical one, although they disobey some of the properties. Okay. So a DR plan where if all pairs of uh, nodes intersect trivially, then all of them are children, non-trivially, uh, then exactly two that are integer. Uh, but then the pseudo sequential DR plan, you don't take C1 and C2, but you take C1 and the pseudo sequential DR plan of C2 difference C1, okay? Um, so, you know, instead of doing this here, where they have this common intersection, um, you basically take this, the, the, the DR plan of this, and the, pseudo -sequential, and the pseudo sequential DR plan of whatever remains, so to speak, right? So the remainder. So the example is here. So this is um, the canonical one, and the pseudo sequential one, you know, keeps this part, uh, keeps this one of the children, C1, let's say. And then it takes the remainder. So in other words, if you threw out the intersection, uh, the intersection in this case is this, this straight prism here, the vertical prism. Uh, what is left over, if you see it, because this triangle belongs to the vertical prism, the only parts that are left over are these three edges that connect the one triangle to the other triangle in the prism and the triangle itself. So, um, and you'd keep doing this, right? So, um, so the first, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to do that proof, but you can prove that this modification of the canonical DR plan um, is not going to change the fan in, optimal fan in. It, it may create more nodes with the same fan in, but the optimal fan at the fan in the overall, you know, we're minimizing the maximum fan in that doesn't change. And you can kind of see it here. So you've got this one node here, which eventually at the end is going to have all of those um, elements. So here, this one will have, a, you know, fan in of five and you have a fan in of five, some node with a fan in of five at the end anyway. So what we can show is that this modification of the canonical DR plan to pseudo sequential DR plan will not change the uh, um, max fanon. It may create more nodes with that fanon, but it won't change the max fanon. So I'm not doing that proof. That's a separate proof. It's very similar. It uses this common anti-chain idea um, and um, that we talked about before and um, in, in, in proving that, that canonical is optimal. So it's exactly the same. It's very similar, right? So now what we do is we actually produce this, the algorithm produces this pseudo sequential DR plan using this idea called a branch, when I, which I think is uh, important in a way. Um, I've never seen it before in, a, in, in um, you know, sort of tree traversal type algorithms. 
So a branch uh, is of a tree, T, is every node on the path from A to B and their children. So essentially what's shown here is the branch. The leaves of the branch is exactly the set of rigid vertex maximal subgraphs of A difference B. So in other words, if you have a tree with a root here and this is B, they take A difference B, then these guys, these black guys, are exactly the rumps of A difference B. And we can find the, the rumps of A difference B in order uh, B squared. We can show that. And so then that's how the algorithm proceeds. So essentially, you, you, just, you can think of a front kind of moving in this direction. Okay. Um, so to, by computing the rumps of, so, so the algorithm starts with a, tries to find a pseudo sequential DR plan by computing the rumps of G difference E for every E. Okay, so it doesn't even need to do it for all E, but at most it will have to do it for all E and doing a quadratic amount of work for each leaf. So uh, we start at a basis step, we compute G as the single node in the DR plan. The recursive step, we compute a branch for each leaf in the DR plan. So how do you do that? You arbitrarily choose a um, leaf L and an edge F in L. And then you compute the rumps of L difference F. And then for each of the rumps, choose an arbitrary edge G and compute the rumps of L difference G. And then compute the branch from L to F using a linear number of intersections to position each leaf. So there is a little bit of a work done. We can compute this rumps easily because we have taken G in intersection E, but then to sort of figure out where they have to be positioned takes a little bit of work. So, um, and that's that. Okay, so uh, so that's the overall um, complex, I mean, uh, analysis of the algorithm to find the pseudo sequential DR plan. And there's another proof that I'm skipping here, which is to show that the DR plan has, um, that the pseudo sequential DR plan has the same maximum plan in as the canonical one. Okay, so what I want to do next is go over for the remaining, you know, I don't know, maybe 50 minutes, uh, go over more carefully what we briefly discussed um, for how do you, after having found the DR plan, how do you optimize the algebraic complexity of solving this parent system given the solutions of the child systems of the DR plan? So in this case, think of this as one node of the DR plan. Um, and, and that node has um, all of these potential children so as you can see, they all have trivial intersections. So in a canonical or pseudo sequential DR, I mean, canonical DR plan, they would all be children, right? <clears throat> what is shown here, which is the, you know, the pink uh, circles, which are triangles. There's a green circle, which is also a triangle. And then there are these, these black circles, which are tetrahedra, I mean, K4s. And they all form the whole thing. And they, uh, oh, I forgot to say, this is of course, we're doing this in three dimensions. And so the trivial intersection here, say between this cluster and the pink cluster, I mean, this black cluster here and the pink cluster here is an edge CG. So, um, so this would be in, in, a, in a canonical DR plan, this would be a situation where you have C, which is the whole thing. And then the CIs all have trivial intersections. And their union is the whole thing. You know, union of them contains all the edges of the original C. So these are all the um, trivial intersection, pair, trivial pairwise intersection children of C. So this would have been the case of claim one. Okay. And now we want to, so, so this is good. So optimal DR plan is, will, will contain this in a way. <coughs> and so what we want to do is figure out now any, any optimal DR plan is going to give you this. Now you're going to further optimize to figure out how to solve the system. And we sketched how we were going to solve the system, sort of, you know, the, the, the obvious way of doing it, 
which is you, you know, pick a minimal arbitrary minimal minimal covering set of child clusters. So covering set in this case is it contains all the vertices. So we picked in this case C1, C2, C3, these three black guys. And then we said, so this, this is the uh, uh, vertices. When we say covering set, we mean it, uh, the vertices, not the edges, whereas the uh, you know, requirement of the DR plan is that the union of the children contains all the vertices and edges of the parent, right? Um, so this is just the vertices. So we um, take these three guys, and then you set this uh, coordinate system, take a minimal covering set. So why, why take more clusters than are needed? And in fact, take the minimum one, and this turns out to be the minimum one, uh, C1, C2, C3. And then take the coordinate system C to be one of the child clusters. So this is the obvious way to do it. So I have unoptimized, so to speak. So uh, set the coordinate system to be one of the child clusters and call it say C1. And now you say, oh, C2 is sort of uh, connected to C1 at this point A. C3 is connected to C1 at the point B. And then th those two, um, I mean, so, and these two have an additional constraint between them. This is the DI. These two have an additional constraint, which is the EF. <coughs> and then the cluster um, C2 and C3, in addition to having a distance constraint, also have an incidence constraint at C. And so you solve this system, have, you know the solutions to these three, so you only solve those three children, and then you um, add these, uh, to, in order to get the system for C, you add these three distance constraints plus two incidence, I mean, one, two, three incidence constraints, okay? And then, to do, and you do the obvious sort of uh, local coordinate systems being transformed using rotation and translations. And that gives you uh, a bunch of variables which are connected by trigonometric relations. And uh, that will give you in the end, uh, something like um, uh, how many equations and unknowns, I think some. Okay, so this will degree at most three in the six variables, blah, 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 related to the three trig relation equations of this form. But we can do better than that by, again, there are two possibilities. <coughs> so the, the, yeah, so this is the original way of doing it. So where this is the home cluster, you know, you have the rotations about these two, and then you could say, in addition, we have, um, no, this is one possible optimized way of doing it, but let's not worry about it. This is the way you, you would do it in the end to, uh, to really optimize things is to take the cluster in the middle. So this is not a minimal covering set. It's not a minimal covering set. You basically take the cluster in the middle as your home cluster. And then you sort of use, uh, you know, the fact that you don't solve explicit incidences. You simply say, well, they have the same AC. So essentially I can parameterize C2 using one single rotation about the AC. And I can parameterize C3's position using a single rotation about this and a single rotation about this. So, <clears throat> So that those are the three rotations. And then you, after that, you simply have um, these, these um, how shall I say, uh, distance constraints left, right? There are no incidences at all. So you just have this three distance constraints. And if you do that, basically, so in other words, you're picking a set that's not the minimal covering set and you choose the middle one as the home cluster. And then you simply uh, do what I just said and you'll get something quite a bit better. Basically, you just have three equations and uh, plus of course this one. And uh, so essentially you have six distance constraints and the six variables uh, compared with eight and then um, all constraints are quadratic, okay? So even that eight already in the first option, uh, as I said, which 
what I initially said was uh, without using the quaternions, but then after we, you know, it's already optimized to get the eight in the first place, but we can do a lot better by just using this non-minimal covering set and this idea. Okay. So, and, you know, the distances uh, remain quadratic because um, uh, there's, you know, you parameterize this using this one rotation. So the coordinates of this are um, not going to increase in degree. So basically you just have a quadratic here. Okay. So for, for this distance, right. So, um, so essentially what we're doing here is that we are uh, using these rational quaternion based parameterizations in that class of parameterizations, we want to minimize the degree slash number of equations. So that's the optimization problem. <clears throat> so this paper that we um, worked on, and this was published in 2010 in the Journal of Symbolic Computation, um, essentially under this class of parameterizations tells you a uh, combinatorial problem that can be a combinatorial optimization problem that then optimizes the algebraic complexity. Okay, so um, I didn't have time, unfortunately, to, um, to make slides out of this, but I will do this <clears throat> before I post it on the uh, copy on the Piazza. So this is starting with a slightly different problem, um, example. Um, it's uh, three, uh, it's very similar. It's not, um, maybe it is the same example. Oh, it is the same example, sorry. It is the same example. So it's got the triangle in between. It's got the three tetrahedra. So this would have been C1. The triangle in the middle would have been one cluster. And uh, C2, C3, C, C1, C2, C3 are the three tetrahedra. And then there's an additional distance constraint that's shown here, right? So, um, so to solve this, um, uh, some of this that we have seen, we have already seen. So I don't, I want to, we, we've seen this, this should be familiar. So to do the pairwise parameterizations, okay, so the notation, okay, TA is the translation that maps A to the origin, T inverse A maps origin to A, um, it's a point A. RAB is the rotation that maps B minus A to the X axis. Okay, so these are these quaternion, I mean, these, these rational quaternion based parameterizations. MBC is the matrix whose columns uh, span R3. So basically it's B, C, B, B cross C. And then T is the undetermined translation <clears throat> that we're trying to find. R is the undetermined rotation uh, about the X axis, one degree of freedom. So essentially these ones. So if you go here, you know, um, we're trying to find the rotation about this central triangle in these three guys, that's an unknown rotation. So that's R. And <clears throat> Q is the undetermined unit quaternion, which is <clears throat> in the case where you the incidence is at a single point, you have three degrees of freedom. <clears throat> that's what we showed um, right in the beginning when I said, so if we did it this way, you have a three degrees of freedom uh, rotation here, as opposed to this one degree of freedom here. So um, that's um, this uh, Q, okay? So, uh, so R looks typically like this, Q looks typically like this, and uh, we're using these you know, simple st stereographic projection. So we're gonna think of C as this number, I mean, all the cosines like this and S like this, Q looks like this. And um, so, Essentially, we uh, apply the quaternion transformations to C2 and C3. We still retain three, three by three incidence equations and three distance equations, uh, reducing the complexity to this. And this was the case that I talked about um, in the sort of intermediate way of doing it with quaternions. But you can actually make it better by choosing C1, C2, C3, C4 as the covering set. 
instead of the minimal covering set, which we picked uh, here as uh, just three of them. So when we started out and said, let's pick three of them, C1, C2, C3, is the unoptimized one. Um, uh, we, we now pick C1, C2, C3, C4. So the middle one and the three, four, uh, three around it, pick the home coordinate system for C4. Since C4 and each of the CI share two points, the position and orientation of CI are now fixed except the rotation of the axis through these two points. These rotations can be explicitly parameterized by these Rs that we had here, undetermined rotation about the X axis. And uh, so the complexity of the parameterized system then becomes three polynomial equations in the variables, the maximum degree of four after clearing the denominator and reduces to two due, due to the identical choice of C1, C2, and C3. So essentially we end up with just two, uh, degree two and uh, three equations. So, okay, so the interpretation, uh, so now we want to say, okay, what is the, what is this, optimization that we just did that allowed us to reduce the complexity among this, I mean, optimize the complexity among this class of rational parameterizations. So what we did is, okay, so here's the picture. So we have the C4 that was in the middle and all of these, you know, complete maximal, I mean, there's the canonical DR plan, all the children have pairwise trivial intersections. They're all present. This is one node of the DR plan. So now we are, uh, by the way, the other case where the two um, side, uh, there are exactly two children and they have a non-trivial intersection, that's extremely easy, right? Because the, you have solved the two children and then they have a non-trivial intersection, which means in 3D, they would have at least three points. So then you just uh, completely, uh, you know, it determines the rotations and translations of one of the clusters because those three points have to be coincide, co coincident. So, uh, it come, you know, there's no, almost nothing to be solved there. So it's the case where you have trivial intersections uh, between the child clusters, that is the difficult case. Okay, so now we are, so when thinking about the way we do the rational parameterization, we think about what is it, what happens to the number of variables and what happens to the degree when each time we do one of these uh, ways of parameterizing. So if we do three, uh, a point, so essentially if you think of the number, uh, you know, number of, uh, so if we are identifying uh, a point essentially, so, or identifying three, sorry, sorry, this is identifying three points, this is the case of the non-trivial intersection you basically have nothing, almost nothing to do, okay? So if, you, if you're identifying two points, then you have this um, you know, rotation about a single axis, and then you have one variable, which represents the rotation about that axis, and then you have degree two by this rational parameterization we talked about. If you, um, in fact, identify a single point, then you have a degree three, I mean, then, then essentially you have three degrees of freedom and you have, so you would have three parameters uh, in the parameterization and the degree will be four by this rational parameterization. If you have no intersections, then there's nothing. So you basically have six degrees of freedom because there's no intersection, so nothing is fixed. And so uh, then you have, degree four. So this is talking about the number of vertices that are in the intersection between two children. If there's a non-trivial intersection, there's almost no work to be done. The intersection is two, just one of the trivial cases. Then we have to, we have a good, pretty good case. So the uh, number of degrees of freedom or the number of new variables that are added in the system is one. Number of variables, if the intersection is single vertex number of extra, I mean, degrees of freedom is three because, you know, one vertex is pinned and the rest have to, has three degrees to move around and the degree of the equation is four and so forth, okay? So that tells us what we want to optimize. So these are the things we want to optimize, obviously. And so, <coughs> and 
with with an emphasis on uh, the number of variables because it's well constrained so the number of that would be the number of equations as well and with the secondary uh, trying to optimize the degree okay so first optimize this then optimize the degree okay um so to do this we can now um, ask the question how well does the system of minimal algebraic complexity from the class of these parameterizations compare with parameterizations of s that are not in this class okay so that's basically the question that we're going to solve so um So these are all properties which we already knew in the canonical DR plan. So the key idea, the key object here is something called an overlap graph. So if you have your standard collection of rigid bodies by which in this case, without loss, we're never gonna consider the uh, non-trivial intersection case because it's so simple. So it's only trivial intersection. So you have the entire complete list of proper maximal rumps, okay? So that's the standard collection that we are looking at. So what we, an overlap graph is a weighted undirected graph whose vertices are the rigid bodies, by which I mean the children of a given node, which has already been, so there they have already been solved. So to speak, their systems have already been solved. And uh, if an edge between a pair of CICJ represents K incidences in that table, the weight WK in that table that we just saw is assigned to that edge. So we're making a graph. Each vertex is a cluster, is one of these guys. So each vertex is going to be one of these guys. An edge between them will be weight, uh, depending on how much is in common. So for example, if you look at uh, C4 and C6, they have in common a single vertex. So the K there is three, WK in that, sorry, WK in that case is three because you know once you fix this vertex, this guy can still move around, has three degrees of freedom. And um, the degree you know, is something that we also consider. Okay, so let's go back here. Okay, so there's a graph that's drawn for this. This is the overlap graph. And you see that C4 is in the middle and it's connected to all of these guys, C, C3, C4, and all of the other ones have been put there. Um, for a moment, we have split this up into C21 and C22, just to show that at the next level, you know, potentially you might have to solve these guys, but don't worry about that, okay? So, um, so both of these together would be the, this cluster C2, and then you um, you find so so you find a minimal covering set. I mean, you don't find you don't need a minimal covering set. What we need is a covering set that uh, uh, such that, it, that you can find a spanning tree with the minimum total weight. Okay, so so here's the spanning tree T. Here's the covering set that we choose, and here's the overall collection. So you start out with the collection of children from which we want to pick a covering set in, in such a way that it has a spanning tree with minimal weight, okay? So is the incidence constraints of the covering set an incidence tree in SC is a spanning tree of the subgraph of the overlap graph induced by this covering set. It represents the set of constraints that includes one, a subset of the incidence constraints, constraints that rigidify the bodies in C. And we will eliminate the constraints in EFT using the parameterizations that were in that table for the weighted value, right? So the remaining constraints that have not been eliminated together with the further distance constraints that are needed to rigidify the bodies that are not covering set form the system. So in this case, for example, if we picked C4 and um, C4, C1, C2, C3, Right, so these two together are C2. So if we pick uh, C4, C1, C2, and C3, then, uh, well, uh, C4, C1, C3, and then it has picked C6 and C5, 
okay? So if you pick these, then um, what happens is you end up with the spanning tree having weight one. So essentially pick C1, C2, C3, C5 and C6, C5 and C6. C5 and C6. So you can see that we have C1, C2, C3, C5 and C6, right? And that's a spanning tree. And you can see that there's one degree of freedom here, one degree of freedom here, one degree of freedom here, one degree of freedom here. The reason we did that, instead of just picking C1, C2, C3, C4, is that now, you don't have this distance constraint in the final system, right? So essentially you've, you've lost this distance constraint. And so you, you just solve this, this, um, this kind of um, C1, C2, C3, C5 and C6. Okay, so this one is attached to this, this one is attached to this. So this is, so you still have one distance constraint, this distance constraint here between C1 and C3, and you, um, one more here between these. Okay. So it turns out that that is the optimal. In fact, what we had here with C1, C2, C3, C4 is not the optimal one either, okay? So once you do this, we'll get um, the, the actual set of constraint. I mean, so here, uh, these are two possibilities. This is problem, this here's the overlap graph, uh, the actual overlap graph, the subgraph of the weighted overlap graph induced by one covering set. So you pick one covering set, covering set remember is all the vertices, covers all the vertices of the parents. This is another covering set. And um, it um, uh, no, it's the same covering set in both cases. You pick the same ones. Here's the spanning tree, and then there's also the choice of the root. Okay, so um, so of all the covering sets, so the first, the algorithm consists of two parts. Find the optimal incidence tree. The optimal incidence trees of all the covering sets remember, uh, determine this set of spanning trees. Overall, the choice of trees and roots determine a rooted tree that minimizes the sum of the depths of all the nodes. The depths of all the nodes gives you the degree, right? So the minimum spanning tree minimizes the number of variables and choosing the, um, the root in such a way that the depth is minimized, minimizes the degree. So essentially, um, and then the part two, after you do this, of course, there's the part two, which you actually solve the system, okay? Um, so that's how this one was solved. Um, and this is all the possible solutions. Um, so this shows as another example, um, bigger, slightly bigger example with an overlap graph. So here, another standard collection of rigid bodies. If you can see, it's a, it's got like a several tetrahedra. If you can see that, there's a tetrahedron. Um, so I think there's a triangle here and a triangle here, but then the other four are tetrahedra. Um, that's another. Turns out to be another prop. Uh, you know, bunch of clusters which have trivial intersections, and then this turns out to be the um, the overlap graph, and then you can pick multiple possible spanning trees uh, of different covering sets, and then we pick one of them, and then we do the, it turns out that you can do all of them in like this one chain with a single distance constraint and a single incidence constraint here. Um, so three incidences plus one distance, and then that turns out to be the optimal one. Um, and you get these solutions. Uh, there's yet another example here, which is a tetrahedron in the middle. As you can see, there are a whole bunch of rigid bodies that you can see here. It's a whole bunch of triangles. There's a tetrahedron in the middle, triangle, 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 triangle. 
triangle, 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 right? So a whole bunch of them. Here's the overlap graph, and that's another uh, collection with the pairwise trivial intersections. So here's the overlap graph, and here are possible spanning trees, and you know, choice of spanning, choice of covering set, choice of spanning tree, choice of the root. The root allows you to minimize the degree. Um, so th those are the optimizations, and then basically the complexity of resolving. Uh, in general, because these systems are small, um, these problems are easy, but the hard part is picking the covering set that minimizes the spanning tree. That's, you can reduce the Steiner tree problem to it, so that's an NP-complete problem. Uh, so uh, in general, if this gets very big, this uh, simultaneous optimization of uh, covering set in order to get the minimum spanning tree, uh, is, is a hard problem. The minimum standing tree by itself, once you pick the covering set, is an easy problem. But you're picking a covering set to minimize the standing tree. That's a hard problem. And then you have a second optimization, which you've separated. You can't optimize two things at the same time. So you first optimize the number of variables, in other words, the covering set and the spanning tree, and then minimize the uh, degree by choosing the root appropriately. So, um, so that's the um, paper here. Um, as you can see, we have done several examples and turn out quite nicely, uh, compared it with some other subdivision. Uh, I mean, we, uh, in terms of actually solving the system, you know, we were pretty agnostic. It was a canned solver. We used this uh, numerical solver by Gauco, uh, turned out to be really fast. Um, um, but we found all the solutions. Um, and so this was just a classification of different solutions for one of the problems here. Um, these are all based on some kind of platforms, you know, Stuart platform type problems. Um, if you look at this, you can think of it as having like a, uh, you know, rigid body on top, like a plate, if you will. And there's a plate at the bottom. Um, Think of this as a kind of a plate. And then you have, you're connecting, uh, you know, all of these to all of those. Um, um, this, this is also a type of a platform. We have five on top and five on the bottom, but these are all tetrahedra here. Um, they're all rigid. They're all, uh, you know, um, they're all isostatic collections. So, okay, so that's um, one uh, paper. Then, yeah. Uh, yeah. I have a quick question. Um, you spoke about how the, the Steiner um, tree problem was NP complete and how that was, um, or NP hard, and how that was um, uh, constraining some of the um, uh, complexity. Yeah. But, um, in practice, when one's got these NP hard problems, we often use um, some kind of uh, non optimal but highly efficient techniques, right? Like we use some kind of randomized approach to, to solving. Yeah. And we yeah. get something that we can prove maybe is within, you know, 90% of the optimal or something like that. Um, do, for the Steiner problem that you mentioned, do you know of um, kind of practical random approaches that would be useful? Um, I'm thinking, by the way, I'm thinking of the combinatorial Steiner tree problem, combinatorial. right? So it's not the geometric Steiner tree. So, um, so yeah, I don't know offhand. I think it is one of those very difficult ones. So the approximation algorithms, uh, you know, once you go to NP, uh, complete problems, they're all NP complete. So in other words, if any one of them had a polynomial time algorithm, P would be equal to NP. Um, but between them, there's a nice gradate, there's a huge gradation of how good the, uh, I can stop sharing here while we talk. Um, there's a big gradation of how uh, difficult the approximation algorithm is. So for example, the traveling salesperson problem you can show that if it has a constant factor approximation, then P would be equal to NP. 
So in other words, there's no constant factor approximation algorithm for a traveling salesperson problem if you believe P is not equal to NP. Uh, similarly, you, it can be shown that the click problem uh, and similar ones close to it, independent set and so forth, um, don't have a, uh, even and something like, let's say there's a click of size square root of N. Uh, you can't even get within, say, n to the one third or something like that. You know, not not just a constant factor, even n to the epsilon factor, right? Uh, unless p equals n p. Mm -hmm. So there's. Uh, on the other hand, you have all these other very nice problems which have constant factor approximations. So you have uh, bin packing, uh, you know, set cover, a um, whole bunch of very easy uh, ones. Uh, which are, can be solved user, either using linear programming relaxations or um, semi-definite programming relaxations. There's a whole class of them that can be solved using semi-definite programming relaxations. So you have a whole bunch of them like that. And then, um, you know, so, so you have whole gradation of uh, problems that have constant factor approximation algorithms some have even, they're even better. They're not just constant factor approximation, they're constant factor approximation schemes, which means that you give me a constant factor and I can solve you, solve it for you in that constant factor if you allow me to run polynomially long in that factor, right? So like Euclidean traveling salesperson problem, it's NP complete, but has that property, right? Um, so, so you have fully, fully polynomial time approximation schemes, then you have constant factor polynomial time approximations. Then at the other end, you have all these problems, which, you know, if they even had something like an n to the epsilon approximation, uh, they, P would be equal to NP, right? Uh, and then you have some things in the middle like traveling salesperson, which don't have constant factor approximations unless P equals NP. So you have this whole gradation of NP complete problem. Now, I believe Steiner tree is one of the harder ones, mm. both the geometric version and the combinatorial version. Uh, so, but, but what we are hoping is that, see, since we've already gone through the optimal DR plan, we have, we have a good DR plan, right? So essentially we, a child, a, a parent, and then the, the number of children is about as small as you can get. So now, our, now for this problem, the recombination problem, that's where we're starting. The number of children is at the size of our overall problem. Mm -hmm. And um, and let's hope that that's small, small enough that our Steiner tree problem is not so big. So in this example that we did, you know, the platform examples. Yeah. No, I mean, that's not, a, you can see the sizes of those trees. Right, they're small, you know, but uh, uh, that portion of the complexity as, as, as uh, uh, you know, the, the, that complexity as a, uh, in perspective, in, as a sense of proportion of the overall algebraic complexity is very, very small, mm -hmm. okay. Sure. So, um, but we had to be honest and say, if you really wanted to do this, it would be the Steiner tree problem, you know. Um, that's why we put it there. Um, okay, so I see a lot of comments on chat. I'm just seeing everybody's happy with when they're presenting. Uh, uh, Alex is talking about monodromy solver. And when did you ask that question, Alex? Sorry, yeah, I was just sort of, I don't think I really understood Will's question, but um, based on um, the answers and stuff and discussion of complexity, but it was, I was just thinking like, it's its very difficult to solve, um, to find all solutions, but often you can use monodromy to find some solutions of a polynomial system and it's a yeah. probabilistic thing, so. Yeah, oh, I see. So what you were talking about RP, I think he was talking about randomized polynomial time algorithms, which most NP complete problems don't have, right? So RP, if, if uh, sorry, people don't believe RP and NP are the same. People believe that RP is most likely polynomial time. Okay, okay. so yeah. yeah. Um, 
So they believe that if you can do something in randomized polynomial time, like for example, primality testing is a classical example, right? In the 80s or maybe very late 80s, it was shown that, um, that testing whether a number is composite is, um, has a randomized polynomial time algorithm. Soon after that, it was shown that in fact, testing of its prime uh, also has a randomized polynomial time algorithm. So in other words, the, it's in the class RP, intersect co-RP, right? Co-RP. So, um, and that class has a name, by the way, it's called a Las Vegas algorithm, which is always correct, almost always fast. Uh, no, P, yes, P equals, Faye is asking uh, whether P equals BPP is a conjecture. Yeah, people believe for sure that- no, I'm saying this, if this is same, same to what you said. Uh, the randomized polynomial time algorithms are one-sided error. So they're a little bit different from BPP, uh -huh. uh, but the conjecture is that P equals RP. So people believe, yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't say it's as strong as a conjecture, but they, they certainly do not believe that randomized polynomial time and NP are the same thing. Neither do they believe that NP and BPP are the same thing. But uh, generally believe that randomization is just an kind of a artifact. We can always de-randomize it. And then you would have a polynomial time algorithm, right? So um, yeah, I know it's her guy, Vigerson is. Vigerson um, yeah. wrote I, I a paper Vigerson. that said either P equals BPP or um, exponential time algorithms um, has have P space and P space and exponential time are the same or something like that. So essentially pointing out that if we don't believe that these two other classes are equal, which we don't, then it should be the case that P equals BPP, right? So I think there's a paper by uh -huh. Impagliazzo and Impagliazzo and Wigdesen. Okay, say indicate that if we don't believe that, I think something like exponential, uh, something like P space and exponential time or something that two other classes are unequal, then we Okay. So, um, you know, we're, we went all over the place. <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, let's see, what other questions were there? Monodromy solver. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. But that's a whole different course. I mean, if I, I love teaching complexity, I've been teaching complexity for a long time. Um, I that'll be a whole different course. Um, let's um, proceed to another aspect of these um, incidences. I mean, trivial intersections of. Uh, systems that are the children of a parent in the DR plan, okay? Share screen. Okay, so first I will go, okay. There's another issue that comes up, which uh, has to be considered, which so far we have not considered, okay? I'm not quite sure what is going on at this point. Maybe I stop share for a second. Give me a moment. I don't know, somehow my uh, Acrobat reader is acting up. Suddenly in the middle of this. There it is. Okay, came back. So go back to Zoom. Um, 
Share screen. There we go. Can you see my um what did it do now? Stop share. There we go. Okay, so I think I'm just not going to increase. The problem was I tried to take it to full screen and it just gave up. Okay, so here we go. Okay, can you see my uh, Acrobat reader? Yes. Thing here, a paper? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's a problem that we have not considered. When we did all of these uh, trivial intersections and treated them as incidences, there is a um, there's a problem that we did not consider, and that's an important problem that gives rise to another underlying matroid. Okay, um, and so we basically wrote three papers about this. Um, the one that I just showed you, and then the second one, which uh, is here, which discusses this particular problem, and then a third paper that sort of connects the uh, combinatorial problem that we solved just now with the overlap graph and the minimum spanning tree and so forth. In the minimum spanning tree, there's the spanning tree. I mean, there's the usual graphic matroid underneath there. And the matroid that I will talk about just now, uh, which relates to incidences. And then uh, we wrote a third paper that sort of puts those two matroids together. The, the graphic matroid with the spanning tree and this one, uh, which I call the seam matroid, uh, puts those two together and talks about a gen uh, common optimization problem. Yeah, or actually shows that if you solve the seam matroid, I mean, you, you find an independent set in the seam matroid, then you can just uh, independently do the optimization that we talked about a moment ago with the spanning tree and. Uh, that's good enough. In other words, it produces the optimal solution in either case. And once you first solve this problem that I'm talking about right now, find an independent set in this in this matroid, and then you apply the second optimization, it works out fine. That's that's what the third problem, third paper did. So what what are we really doing here? So what we're saying is that if we had let's say three rigid bodies, C1, C2, C3 which correspond to the children of a parent C, let's say, uh, in, a well, in, a, in a minimally rigid system. C1, C2, C3 themselves are mini minimally rigid subsystems. I simply call them rigid bodies. Um, and they are have this, this pattern of incidences. So in other words, they all three of them uh, share a vertex and two, every pair of them shares two vertices. What this is showing is the different ways in which you can think about the incidences. So you could say, for example, okay, so the important thing to notice is that um, the because this distance between V3 and V4 is actually the same distance in C1 and C2, it better be the same. If it is not the same, then you cannot put them together. It could be a, uh, <clears throat> ill, I mean, would not have a solution. So because this, uh, there is this extra constraint, this incidence, you know, this incidence between C1 and C2 along this, <clears throat> uh, that, that shares this pair that has the same distance between these two means that if you are established, if you're writing down the incidence, you do not have six equations. So in other words, you don't have three, X, I mean, this in three dimensions. Let's, uh, so there's X, Y, Z here and uh, X, Y, Z here. You would say, oh, the, uh, the, the coordinates of this point in this cluster is equal to the coordinates of this point in this cluster. That would be three incidences and three incidences here. But because this distance is in fact the same between them, there are only three plus two independent such um, incidences that you can establish. Otherwise it would be an over-constrained system. 
Similarly, uh, you can do the same thing here between these two. And then once you have done that, uh, in fact, there are only two other incidences that you can establish without making it an over-constrained system. Here's another possibility is that you put three here, two here, just any pair, X, instead of X, Y, Z, you put X and Y, and then here again this, and then you put here a, a different one, the Z coordinate, same between these two. And then you put one incidence here, pick whatever you want, X, Y, or Z, and then you put three incidences here. Or you have this. <coughs> so, um, essentially, this is saying that they're all, I mean, wh which do you pick? Which of them is uh, independent? Um, are they dependent? Maybe some of these um, incident systems. So, so essentially, just trying to pick a set of incidences, keeping in mind the only sort of dependence is caused by the fact that this distance between these guys, say this distance or this distance is the same is already fixed between these, okay? So, um, and it turns out that having a well-constrained system, so in other words, an independent system, is important because you, you, you actually do it, you actually practically see the problem. Uh, if you have an over-constrained system, it just turns out to be badly conditioned and you end up with no solution. You know, when you give it an over-constrained system, uh, for example, I started out and I just gave three, 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 and this distance is fixed. It will, you might expect that, you know, if this distance is the same in these two, there would be a way to reconcile <clears throat> the three coordinates of the point on this side, three coordinates of the point on this side and so forth. But there's small errors in the solution when we found the coordinates of these points, when we solved C1. And similarly here, so the exact distance between them in this cluster versus this cluster turns out to be slightly different. So that now when you try to equate these three and equate these three, it'll come back and say no solution, okay? So this is, it's not some cooked up kind of problem here. In fact, the problem came about because we faced this issue that it would come back and say no solution. So we had to pick an independent system. And so <clears throat> independent system of incidences, and that's where this came from. So, um, so, <clears throat> somehow it's extremely slow. So, um, These are just three ways, the, the different ways that are being cho uh, chosen. So we want to avoid these introduced incidence over constraints. Okay, uh, close this guy, close this. Our dependences while retaining any inherent over constraints. So in other words, there may be some inherent over constraints which we don't want to throw out. Okay, it's just that we don't want to introduce these guys. You can actually ignore this inherent over constraints because in the in the problem that we are thinking about, we're starting out with something that's independent. System is independent, so there are no over constraints that are already there. There are no dependent existing dependencies. So we want to attempt. We want to uh, detect only these these in these dependencies that we are introducing when we are doing the recombination, where we're treating. Uh, the, com, uh, the the solution for, I mean, sorry, the system for solving C given the solutions of CIs, the children CIs, as a system of, because they have trivial intersections as a system of incidences, okay? So the second attempt at the above example, on there are only six incidence constraints at point V4. V4 is the one that's in the middle that are independent three of them between C1, C2, and three of them between C2, C3, because once you say C1 is identified with C2 and C2 is identified with C3, you have automatically identified C1 with C3 at the point V4, right? So the, there's, uh, you say these two are equal, these two are equal at the point V4, then all three are equal at the So the <clears throat> other three complete a cycle of incidences and hence give a locally detectable 
dependence. Okay, so, um, so discarding these three reduces the number of incidences to 15, but they still clearly form a dependent system. Okay, so here, this is this example. Uh, I don't know, it's so hard for me to scroll somehow. It takes a long time. Uh, uh, just the Acrobat reader is reacting very slowly. Okay. So just saying that this, this is the one that we just discussed. So we've got uh, three here, three here. Once we have said that the V4 position here is equal to this, then we don't put these. And then we put the two, two, two here. Okay. So this is independent. Okay. Now, um, the third attempt. Okay, third attempt. Okay, so we did this already. Um, three within C2 and C3. Okay, 15. Okay, third attempt notes that the shared distance constraint between each pair of clusters permits a total of only five independent incidence constraints. The shared distance is the one between V4 and V3 or V4 and V2 and V4, V1. And so to account, uh, choose three incidence constraints at the points V1, V2 and V3, totaling nine, <clears throat> and only four independent incidences point V4, let's say two incidents for the X and Y coordinates between this and two. This reduces the number of incidents to 13, but they're still clearly dependent, okay. Fourth attempt, avoiding both the above types of local dependencies, taking care to choose only 12 incidences still does not guarantee an independent system where in the right of figure one, choose three incidences each at points V2 and V3, one at V3, uh, two incidents for X, Y, X, et cetera, but we show that the last incidence is dependent on the 10 incidences between C1 and C3 and between this, okay? So just illustrating that Figuring out whether it's independent or not is not an easy thing. So for a small example, you may be able to do it, but in general, you know, you need to analyze the underlying matroid. So, <clears throat> so this is, um, so these are all the ones that were actually in the figure. The first three attempts that I read about were not actually in the figure. Okay. Um, oof to complete maximal decomposition, which we have heard about, which is this. Um, okay, so here's an example. Uh, yeah, so this, this is another example, which illustrates the problem, just illustrating the problem. Okay. Um, so I want to get to the picture where the C matroid is shown, but it's very hard to do. Okay, here. Um, another problem is being illustrated about what happens if you chose incident. I mean, um, uh, if you choose um, dependent constraints. Okay, so we have the complete maximal decomposition, which we know about, which we're going to assume. Um, canonical decomposition. And then, so we're using a simple count. We're assuming everything is independent and so on and so forth. We're using a simple count of the degrees of freedom. And now we're going to define, under this assumption, we're going to define a well-formed system of incidences. Okay, so um, it has no local cycle of incidences. So for any VL um, and K greater than or equal to three, 
so there's there's this recombination system is what we call I of um, the set of incidences that we have here between the system uh, is what we call I. Um, and um, no local cycle. Uh, so if you essentially have V followed by CIC2L and then V CI, CI2, CI3L, et cetera, blah, 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 blah. So that clearly creates a local uh, cycle of incidences. Um, then ID, if, if, if sorry, if, if all of these are there, then we don't want to have a co um, the incidents, inc incidents between the first one and the last one. Okay, so that's one. Then we've got, so V and L are the two, um, uh, two uh, vertices on which C1, I mean, each of these two pair, pair of clusters is incident, okay, incidents, incident. Then if you have a subset of clusters, then those incidents, then we want to ensure that the sort of the obvious incidence degree of freedom count has to be less than or equal to what you expect for that subset of clusters, right? So, and then the overall number has to be equal to the, for a well-constrained system, what do you expect for a well-constrained system. So we're starting out with the whole thing being minimally rigid, all subsets are minimally rigid, everything like that. Because we have this, uh, we're starting out with something like a canonical um, uh, DR plan, which we call the complete maximal DR plan in this case. Okay, so all of those basic assumptions you, uh, you, you take. Okay, so um, having said that, we have this seam graph that we can define from which you can get an underlying matroid. I'm gonna really go quickly here. Uh, in fact, it's probably easier for me to just uh, describe the matroid with the picture. Um, so, especially because I'm having such trouble moving this Acrobat <laughs> data document. Okay, so here's the, um, these are the different seam, uh, this, this is what we call a seam graph. This is the graph on which the matroid is defined. And um, so these, this is a seam path, this is a seam cycle, and oh no, I give up. I think I'm gonna have to do this um, at, on Thursday. I think we'll have time on Thursday. I'll stop here.